I'm continuing with uh, the series of messages on the Minor Prophets. And this is the fourth message in that series. It's the third message from Hosea. The first one was an introduction to all of the Minor Prophets. And uh, in this message, we are going to be looking at Hosea 13 and then jumping all the way into the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 15. And the two are connected because Paul uh, quotes from Hosea 13 in 1 Corinthians 15. Um, so, uh, the minor prophets are full of terrifying warnings of God's righteous judgment. And if they don't feel, when you read the minor prophets, <coughs> if these are warnings of God's judgment and his wrath against sin, if they don't feel terrifying to you, then it may be that you do not realize how relevant they are to our day and time and to our lives and our neighbors. So there's no doubt that uh, the minor prophets are mainly uh, directly speaking to situations uh, that are far away from where most of us live, unless you happen to live in Israel, but also far away in time for all of us, uh, uh, 2,700 years ago. Um, and so they might feel irrelevant, but our world today is very similar. I know that the nation I live in, the United States, in many ways, we are very similar to the way Israel was as God's judgment approached. And God is still the same, and the nature of sin is still the same, and so there are truths and principles that are very relevant to us today. Uh, but the minor prophets uh, aren't just full of terrifying warnings of God's righteous judgment. They are also full of God's grace and promises and future hope. And I am so thankful for that because we, we need uh, the good news. We need God's grace and we need hope. Now, there's a, now I, I haven't covered every chapter in Hosea in this series. I'm not going to cover every chapter, every verse uh, in the Minor Prophets. Uh, that would be a very long series. Um, but we have two chapters left, 13 and 14, and I do plan on covering both of these chapters in Hosea. Th two chapters left that I'm going to cover. Uh, I've skipped some. Uh, let's pray, and then we'll talk about this a little bit more. Heavenly Father, I pray that you will speak to us uh, mainly through Hosea 13 in this message, but also very importantly through 1 Corinthians 15, both about how terrible sin is and um, the nature of your righteous wrath and judgment against sin, but then also that you will speak to us about the glorious hope that we have through Jesus Christ and the fact that he died for our sins. Uh, bless us and speak to us through your word, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, uh, continuing on, uh, this week we are going to focus on, on Hosea 13, but as I mentioned, we are going to also look at the connection with 1 Corinthians 15, and that's where we're going to find uh, some really encouraging hope at the end of the message. So hang in there, because chapter 13 largely focuses on the terrifying warnings and the judgment, and then uh, next week, we are going to uh, focus more on uh, chapter 14, where we find uh, a, a lot more focus on God's grace and promises and how he saves us. And uh, I think both messages are important and both are ultimately encouraging. Um, so, so I'm going to uh, turn off my webcam now so that, the, the, so that I have the whole screen available for voices and, 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 and notes. So here we go. Okay, uh, continuing on. Um, well, let's jump in. Hosea 13, jumping in with verse 2 and 3. Now they, referring to Israel, now they sin more and more. They make idols for themselves from silver, cleverly fashioned images, all of them the work of craftsmen. It is said of these people, they offer human sacrifices. They kiss calf idols. Therefore, they will be like the morning mist, 
like the oily dew that disappears, like shafts swirling from a threshing floor, like smoke escaping through a window. One of the terrible things about the nature of sin is that uh, if God doesn't intervene, um, if we don't find God's grace and start to follow him, is that sin tends to become worse and worse. I'm not saying it's always that way for everybody all the time, but outside of Christ, that is definitely the tendency. It's definitely the tendency for individuals, and it's also the, the tendency whole cultures, whole societies. Um, if, if, if they are not being influenced by uh, the gospel, or if gospel influence is decreasing, sin tends to happen more and more, and eventually people start doing terrible things uh, on a widespread basis that people wouldn't have imagined would have been done uh, maybe in a previous generation or 30 or 40 or 50 or 60 years ago. In the case of Israel, things had gotten so bad that they were offering human sacrifices to false idols. And behind these false idols, there's demonic powers. It had just, they just sunk into terrible, dark wickedness and evil, and, um, and, and, and God hates it. Now, I'm glad that God hates evil because evil hurts people. Um, we wouldn't want the most powerful being in the universe to kind of sort of be okay with evil, would we? So God really hates this evil, and I feel like uh, this describes in some way the nation I live in, the United States, that we have been sinning more and more, that the types of sin and the amount of sin uh, today is m more, at least it appears to me to be more than it was 20 years ago, than it was 40 years ago. Um, it's not to say that that's 100% true. It's certainly not true for every individual. It's not that nothing has improved. Some things improved some. But overall, I feel like we have had a downward trend where sins that were at least generally recognized as sinful uh, are now not only openly and widely practiced, they are actually promoted and even celebrated. So I feel like this is very relevant to us. And uh, then in verse 3, it says, Therefore they will be like the morning mist, uh, like the oily dew that disappears, like shafts swirling from a threshing floor, like smoke escaping through a window. The point is, God is going to wipe them out, and they're going to be gone. Um, so, uh, you know, the morning mist, the sun shines on it, and it evaporates. It's gone. Uh, the, it disappears. The shaft gets blown away. The smoke is gone. Um, now, this description of the fate of those who reject God applies to people in general, not just to Israel 2,700 years ago. So let's see some verses where we will see that this is true. Psalm 1-4 after the first few verses describing the righteous who are meditating on God's word. And, uh, but then in verse 4 it says, Not so the wicked, they are like shaft that the wind blows away. And here this is talking about, in general, people who are not following God um, uh, are, are going to be like shaft that's blown away. So in Hosea, he's talking to a specific people in a specific time. But what he says is true for sinners in general. We see this very strongly in Psalm 37, uh, looking at a number of verses um, here. Uh, it says, A little while, and the wicked will be no more. Though you look for them, they will not be found. Verse 20, But the wicked will perish. Uh, though the Lord's enemies are like the flowers of a field, they will be consumed. They will go up in smoke, just like Hosea says. Those the Lord blesses will inherit the land, but those he curses will be destroyed. I've seen a wicked and ruthless man flourishing like a luxuriant native tree, but he soon passed away and was no more. Though I looked for him, he could not be found. But, uh, and then uh, jumping to verse 38, uh, but all sinners will be destroyed. There will be no future for the wicked. And if we jump into the New Testament, we see the same type of language. Uh, this is, I believe, John the Baptist speaking. His winnowing fork is in his hand. He will cl uh, clear the threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the shaft 
with unquenchable fire. So, so, so the, the unrighteous, people who do not find the righteousness of Christ through faith in him, they are going to, they are going to be like shaft that either gets blown away by the wind or burned up by fire. They're going to be like smoke. They're going to be like ashes. We could look at many more verses that teach the same thing. The point is that what Hosea is warning, uh, the warning he's giving specifically to Israel shortly before God's judgment came in the form of uh, Assyria coming and defeating the armies of Israel and capturing their towns, killing many of their people, and the ones they didn't kill, they took them captive. Uh, that specific warning is is uh, applicable to all of us today in the way that God hates and judges sin. Okay, uh, Hosea 13, verse 5, I cared for you in the wilderness in the land of burning heat. This is talking about when God saved Israel out of Egypt. When I fed them, they were satisfied. When they were satisfied, they became proud. Then they forgot me. Uh, so prosperity can lead to pride which can lead to forgetting about God. I personally believe that this principle um, is probably one reason that there's not more prosperity in the world and that God allows there to be a lot of poverty in the world. It's not that God likes seeing people in poverty, struggling to have their basic needs met, struggling to have food, to feed their families, to be clothed, to have basic medical care, to have decent housing. It's, but if God gives everybody all of those things and nice versions of all of those things, which he's a good God, he would love to do that, but the danger is that people tend to become proud then. They imagine that they got all that stuff because they work hard and they're smart. And of course it's good to work hard. Of course it's good to be smart. But they forget that that without God, none of those blessings would be there and that it's by God's grace that we have any blessings we have. And does that always lead to people forgetting God? No, not everyone in Israel forgot God when they were blessed. And not everyone today forgets God when they are blessed. But it happens so often that I think this is a big reason that God doesn't give more blessings because is it really a blessing if he gives us more prosperity, and then for 40 or 50 or 80 or 90 years, we have a more comfortable life. And then on Judgment Day, we come under its wrath and we're burned up and destroyed. God is being gracious to us sometimes by not giving us more prosperity. And that's a hard truth, uh, but it's an important truth to remember. Now, we still have some more verses to look at in chapter 13. I'm not going to look at every verse. We're going to look at verses 7 through 9, 14a, which means the first part of verse 14, and then the second part of verse 14 through uh, verse 16. Uh, but I'm going to discuss the one in the middle. I'm going to discuss this one after the other two, even though it comes in the middle. And I think you'll see why I'm going to do that. Uh, I just wanted to let you know ahead, so hopefully it will help you follow along. Okay, uh, verse 7. Uh, God says, so I will be like a lion to them, like a leopard. I will lock by the path, like a bear robbed of her cubs. I will attack them and rip them open. Like a lion, I will devour them. A wild animal will tear them apart. You are destroyed, Israel, because you are against me, against your helper. Wow. God's wrath against sin and against sinners is terrible. It's like a lion tearing apart his prey. God really hates sin, and we should hate sin. We should most of all hate our own sin. It's, it's, it's right to hate all sin, but we should begin by getting the, the, the logs out of our own eye before we get the, you know, the, 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 the little specks of, of sawdust out of somebody else's eye. Uh, we should hate sin. God hates sin, and he's right to hate sin because sin is so terrible, and we already talked about how it gets worse and worse, and people end up doing just terrible, awful things. And, and so God's response to sin is, is correct. Uh, he, he is going to just tear them apart because of their sin. This is the judgment that is coming. 
And it would come on all of us except for God's grace and righteousness, forgiving us of our sins, and then also beginning to transform us to become more Christ-like. Now look at this. It says, you are destroyed, Israel, because you are against me, your helper. When we sin against God, when I sin against God, when you sin against God, and all sin is sinning against God. Now, um, that doesn't mean that it's not also sinning against someone else. But at the ultimate level, we are breaking God's law whenever we sin. When we sin against God, we are foolishly sinning against the very one who helps us, the very one who gives us air to breathe, the very one who loves us, the very one who wants to do good for us. He's the one we're sinning against. And so that's part of another part of what makes sin so, so terrible. Now, jumping past the first part of Hosea 14, we're going to jump in here. God says, I will have no compassion, even though he thrives among his brothers. An east wind from the Lord will come, blowing in from the desert. He will, his spring will fail and his well dry up. His storehouse will be plundered of all its treasures. He's talking about what's going to happen um, to Israel when God sends his judgment, and the big judgment is going to be in the form of this enemy nation coming and defeating them, uh, which actually did happen shortly after the time of Hosea. Uh, verse 16, the people of Samaria, that's referring to Israel, the northern kingdom, the people of Samaria must bear their guilt because they have rebelled against their God. They will fall by the sword. Their little ones will be dashed to the ground. Their pregnant women ripped open. Oh Lord, how terrible our sin is that it deserves this type of judgment. Again, we see God's wrath against sin. And remember how terrible th their sin had gotten. They were sacrificing people. And in other parts of the Old Testament, we find out they were sacrificing their children. Uh, uh, some of them were doing this, human sacrifices. It, it just terrible, terrible evil. Reminds me some of the types of evil that are happening in the nation I live in, in the world I live in today. Um, the people of Samaria must bear their guilt. That's true. God is a just judge, but this is not the whole story. We need to think about how terrible sin is, or we won't appreciate how wonderful salvation is. We are going to look at some of the good news here, so hang on. Uh, think If this was the whole story, whew, what's the point of reading it? It's just going to get us depressed before we get judged and destroyed, but thankfully, it's not the whole story. And there is hope and there is a good reason to know what God says because there's a way of salvation. So next, let's look at what comes between these fierce expressions of God's wrath uh, that come before verse 14 and at the end and after verse 14. Uh, here we have the beginning of verse 14 and we find something shockingly different. It, it doesn't seem to fit at all. God says, I will deliver this people from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. Where, O death, are your plagues? Where, O grave, is your destruction? Wow. All, it's like right in the middle of all this judgment, there's this shining good news. But now I'm going to share with you something that's a little bit complicated. It can be a little bit confusing. Uh, and we're going to walk through that. Uh, I, I hope I'm going to be able to help you walk through it. And then we're going to get back to this good news. So we are going to get back to the good news. Hang in there with me. Um, it turns out that there's a translation issue here. And not all translations translate this the same way. Let's look at what the... So, so we've been looking at the New International Version. Let's look at the New English Translation. I think both of these translations overall are excellent translations. Um, it says, will I deliver them from the power of Sheol? No, I will not. Will I redeem them from death? No, I will not. Oh, death, bring on your plagues. Oh, Sheol, bring on destruction. That's a drastically different translation. In the, in, in, in the, it's the same part of the same verse, but... In the NIV version, it's a promise of deliverance and redemption and rescue from death. 
And in the New English Translation version, it's a statement that God is going to, that God is calling, that God is not going to redeem them, and God is calling death to destroy them. So, wow. Uh, when you, most of the time, differences in translation are not this opposite, but every now and then they are. And so I, I, I want to think about this with you. And like I said, at first it can be confusing. So let's think about some different translations. We are blessed with so many excellent English translations. I, I, I think that all of these translations, I think, are, are good. Some of them um, have slightly different purposes in the way that they're good. Uh, but we have a lot of good translations. And a number of them are very similar to the NIV, positive translation. The English Standard Version, the King James Version, the Christian Standard Bible, and I think the ASV stands for Authorized Standard Version, all tend to have this more positive, uh, promise, hopeful statement. Um, the New American Standard and the New Revised Standard Version lean towards the negative version, but they're a little bit in the middle. And then the um, New Living Translation, the, the, the CEV, I think that's the Contemporary English Version, and the Good News Translation all have this more um, negative version where it's a warning of judgment instead of a promise of redemption. So, you know, uh, wh what's, what's going on here? Um, and, and again... I, I think that, that, that those translations are all good. Some of them are more literal than others, um, but I think all of them can be helpful. Uh, I, 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 some people think that some of those translations are bad. I, there are some bad translations out there, but none of those ones I listed I don't think are bad. Um, and um, so what's going on? Why, why are these translations kind of opposite? Um, so first I want to say this. I'm not at all strong in Hebrew. I had two semesters of Hebrew when I was in seminary like uh, more than 20 years ago. And I, I also had Greek. I had three semesters of Greek. I kept up with my Greek, uh, but I did not keep up with the Hebrew. I was, I was also, I, I, shortly after the seminary, I was learning another modern language I was learning Indonesia because we were living Indonesian because we were living in Indonesia and I just I, I realistically I couldn't do everything well and I and I kind of let my Hebrew slide um, I don't think that was wrong but um, we all have to have priorities but I I what I'm saying is if you want somebody to explain the details of the original Hebrew I'm not going to try to do that uh, you can you can find resources, commentaries that do that. Um, but, I, but I do know some about translation. I've, I haven't done Bible translation, like, formally, but I've, I've, I've worked with the Bible in different languages, in Greek, in English, in Indonesian. I became fluent in Indonesian. I have translated other things, not the Bible, uh, from, like, English to Indonesian or Indonesian to English. So I've thought about translation a lot. We lived in Indonesia 14 years uh, and I do know that in translation, one needs to consider many factors, including the grammar, the words, and also the context. All of these have to be considered. And the correct translation, lots of times, is, it, 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 it's, it's pretty obvious. And there's more than one way to translate something. But the basic gist of it, the, the basic meaning, most of the time is pretty obvious. But sometimes it just isn't. And sometimes different meanings are possible and sometimes those meanings are like almost opposites like this time uh, that just happens sometimes it's the nature of language now after researching this quite a bit and and, and, and asking some people and reading articles from people who are ex who do know the Hebrew very well uh, here's what I found I'm, I'm not going to share with you all the details I'm just going to give you kind of a summary of what I found and hopefully this will help you and we are going to get back to the really glorious good news in, uh, in, in just a few minutes. So hang in there. Um, number one, while the grammar and language allows either type of translation, the more positive one or that, that's focused on a promise of redemption or the more negative one that's focused on a warning of judgment, 
uh, it allowed the, the grammar and the language allows either type of translation. The simplest reading of the grammar and language is the more positive version. So if you shouldn't take a verse out of its context and look at it all by itself and figure out the meaning. But if you did that and you only based it on the Hebrew, you would come up probably people who do translation. And if you were, for instance, a student in a class taking your second or third semester of Hebrew, you would probably come up with a translation more like the NIV, the one that's positive and hopeful, a promise of redemption. Uh, but that's not the whole story. Um, the context of Hosea 13, if you look at the verses that come after it, after verse 14 and the verses that come before verse 14, the context strongly favors the judgment version. But it cannot rule out the positive merciful version because sometimes in the middle of lots of judgment, God throws in a wonderful promise of coming salvation. So, so if, if, if you were uh, just looking at the context, you would pick the more negative version. And, um, okay, uh, there were two more important facts to consider. And, and some of you are already thinking about one of these, that probably more likely the second fact I will get to. So here's these two additional facts. Uh, in a way, it makes it even more complicated, but eventually it's going to uh, help us. So the original Hebrew was translated into Greek before Jesus was born. And this translation is called the Septuagint. It's an ancient translation from Hebrew into Greek. And here's the thing about the Septuagint. Uh, the New Testament authors use it a lot. The New Testament is written all in Greek, and sometimes it appears that they are trans making their own translation from the original Hebrew into Greek. But uh, many times it looks like they're, trans they're, they're quoting uh, straight from the Septuagint or very close to the Septuagint. Um, now, the Septuagint, uh, definitely matches the more positive version seen in the NIV. This is all part of the forced additional fact. So if you were basing your translation on the Septuagint, you would have the, 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 the NIV type of translation, not the NET type of translation. The, the, the positive promise, not the warning of judgment. Um, and I have to admit that surprised me a little bit. Um, the Septuagint might match the more positive version, because sometimes the Septuagint is a, a, a rather wooden, word-for-word, -word liter literal translation. But I've looked at it, and I'm a little bit better at that, than, a, a lot better at that than I am at the, at the Hebrew, because the Septuagint's in Greek. And uh, sometimes uh, it, it seems to me like they were not thinking about the context and the flow of the thought very much. They were just kind of going word-for-wordish, which sometimes that produces a good translation, and sometimes it doesn't. So that's one possible explanation. Another possible explanation is perhaps the authors of the Septuagint, being closer in time to Hosea than we are, had a better sense of the original intended meaning. And, 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 and so they actually got it right in translations like the NA, NET uh, might not be correct. Uh, that's also possible. Now here's the second big fact, and this one is so important. Paul quotes part of Hosea 13, 14, and uses it, he quotes it uh, approximately. He, it, it's, it's so close that it's obvious that he's getting his wording mostly from the Septuagint. He, he, he quotes it in a very positive, hopeful, and victorious way. He quotes uh, with a very minor change that doesn't change the, 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 the main point. It doesn't change the meaning. It doesn't change the tone. He, I, I think he changes out like one word, um, uh, he, and, and, and he quotes it from the Septuagint. Uh, so, so that's matching the NIV type of translation more. Um, so here, here's where Paul quotes it, 1 Corinthians 15, 55. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? And in this context, Paul has been talking, we'll look at uh, a little bit more of the passage in a minute. But Paul has been talking about the resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15 is the resurrection chapter. Uh, it talks about the glorious resurrection of Jesus and 
the fact that we who believe in Jesus are also going to be gloriously resurrected. And when we who believe in Jesus are resurrected, we will have immortal, incorruptible bodies like the resurrection body of Jesus. Death will no longer be able to harm us. We will have been set free from death because we won't be dead anymore. Our bodies will be resurrected and alive, never to die again. And this is like a victory shout. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? Hallelujah. That's how Paul uses it. Uh, So which translation, going back to Hosea, more accurately reflects what Hosea initially intended to communicate? Did Hosea initially intend to communicate Uh, a a, a wonderful, hopeful promise in the midst of lots of judgment, even though it doesn't seem to fit? Or uh, did he mean to, was this just part of the warning of judgment? And I honestly don't know. And um, it's okay. I mean, even these experts at Bible translation came up with different translations. And I think if you look at what people say, probably the experts on both sides knew that the other translation was a possibility. Um, So, you know, if even the experts can't say for sure, how much less do I feel like I can say for sure which which one Hosea had most in mind? But I do know what Paul meant, and I do know the heart of the gospel. And so I want to offer this possibility as we get near the end here. I I, I found an analogy addressing this specific issue in a Got Questions article. Got Questions is a website, it's a group that um, it, it, it will have all kind of questions that people ask about the Bible and about Christianity. And I, I think most of the time, they'll, and then they give an answer. And, uh, and they find different people to write the answers for them. It's not like two or three people write all their articles. They find someone who who knows a lot about that topic, and, get, and, and they write an answer. Um, they look to me like they're a good, solid, evangelical, Bible-believing, Jesus-loving uh, group, and I, I often find their answers to be helpful, like, like anything produced by people. It's, it's not perfect. Uh, my material isn't perfect. I don't know where my mistakes in interpretation are, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure I make some. By God's grace, I feel confident that on none of the major issues, uh, I, I, all of the most important doctrines, Jesus dying for our sins, rising again, that stuff, I'm, I'm very, very confident in. But I'm sure I make some mistakes. They make some mistakes. But I just want to mention this because I think they're a good resource. And, and, and so you might want to use them sometime. Well, they have an article specifically about Hosea thirteen fourteen, specifically about the exact question and issues we have been discussing. And and they give an analogy. They say, imagine that you were guilty of a crime and you go before the judge and it's obvious that you're guilty. And the judge says, shall I let this prisoner go? Executioner, where is your ax? I will not have pity. He knows you're guilty. And uh, so when he says, executioner, where is your ax? He's he's telling the executioner, go get your ax because he's not going to have pity you deserve to get your head chopped off, and that's what's going to happen to you. And that's kind of the the uh, the NET translation of of, of Hosea uh, thirteen fourteen follows that ideal, um, and maybe that's what Hosea originally meant. But then the Apostle Paul, after Jesus dies for our sins, and we are saved from God's wrath, we are saved from the certain death that we des- we deserved. Our sins are forgiven. Like Paul, if, if, we were, if we were standing before that judge and, 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 and then someone came in and said, Judge, hold on. Someone's already paid his price. Someone's already been executed in his place. And the judge says, what? It would be wrong to have uh, the penalty pay, have to be paid twice. And, and he looks at you and he says, your penalty has been paid. Your sins are forgiven. You're free to go. Hallelujah. We might shout, Executioner, where is your axe? Not saying, go get it. Saying, you don't need it now. (laughs) it's, it's, It's gone now. I've been forgiven. I've been set free. I think maybe this is what happened. Uh, 
Maybe Hosea did initially mean those verses as part of the whole chapter 13, focusing on God's judgment coming on Israel, but then Paul takes those same words and uses, flips them and says, now we've been saved, now we've been set free, and I know we've been saved, I know we've been set free. If you believe in Jesus, this is definitely true. Uh, you are no longer under the death penalty. Hallelujah. That is good news. Now let's look at 1 Corinthians 15, a little bit more of the passage. Paul writes uh, up in verse 3, For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins. Hallelujah. That's, that, that, that's why we don't have to die for our sins. Jesus, already, Jesus paid it all. Uh, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures that he was buried that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and we will be resurrected like him. Jumping down to verse 54, the whole chapter is about resurrection, but we're going to jump down to verse 54. When the perishable has been clothed with imperishable, that's talking about when we're raised from the dead and we no longer have a body that can perish, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that it's written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. That comes from Isaiah, but then he quotes from uh, Hosea. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But the law has been satisfied. We're no longer under law. We're under grace. We don't have to pay the death penalty. We don't have to be executed and destroyed and perish and be burned up and be like smoke being blown away out of window anymore because Jesus paid for our sins. But thanks be to God, he gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So I don't know for sure how Hosea was using those, that, that, that part of the passage, but I know for sure how Paul uses it, and I know the good news that applies to you and me today. Now these are not just academic truths to study. They are that, but they are also much more. These are glorious promises to celebrate and sing about. Now, there are many songs that celebrate Christ's victory over death and what that means for us also, our own promise of resurrection. One that goes along very well with the passages in this whole message that we have looked at, and I went back and listened to it a couple of times, uh, is a Petra's song, Grave Robber. Now, let me say a couple of things about it. Um, the style will not be everybody's favorite style. So if you prefer a different style, by all means, Go and sing and listen to, uh, you know, whatever style of Christian music that you love. Um, the, the, the song was sung first in the mid-80s, I believe, and that's when I was in college. And I loved Petra back then, and every now and then I go back and listen to those old, old songs. Well, this one that they sing, Grave Robber, they sing about these verses. They sing about this glorious truth. You might, I'm not including the song here in the video because of copyright issues, but you can easily find it on YouTube. You might want to, after we pray in a minute, uh, don't skip the prayer, that's important. Uh, you might want to go listen to that song and just uh, celebrate these important truths that we have looked at uh, today. Let's uh, close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do need to remember how awful and terrible sin is because we won't understand how desperately we need salvation and how wonderful salvation is until we feel how terrible our sin is. My sin personally and the sin of the society and the nation I live in is terrible. We deserve to be destroyed. We deserve to be burned up. Uh, like weeds in a fire and turned into smoke and turned into ashes like the people of Sodom and Gomorrah were turned to ashes. We, we deserve that fate. But I thank God. Uh, thank you, Lord. Thank you that you have made a way that Jesus died for our sins so that if we trust in him, we can be redeemed from death. And death will not have the final say. It will not be victorious over your people. We will be resurrected forgiven of our sins, transformed to that in eternity we won't sin anymore, we will be forgiven, death will not be victorious, <laughs> we will be victorious over death through our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.